One of the great questions that we have to answer in life is, what do we want our life to be about? The choices we make, the things we pursue, the, the effort and the energy we pour into our everyday, what's it all about? You know, it's interesting, whether we realize it or not, there is really something foundational inside of us that guides those choices and those decisions and those thoughts. And whether we realize it or not, what that thing is, is what do we treasure most? Back in 2010, there was a, um, an art gallery owner named Forrest Finn, and Forrest Finn had ran into a little bit of legal trouble and decided that he was going to create his own treasure hunt. So he took gold coins and artifacts from South America and all these different areas, and he put them in a, a really cool treasure box, and he buried them in the Rocky Mountains. Some of you might even remember reading about this. He wrote a book called The Thrill of the Chase, and in that he wrote a poem. And in that poem, he gave instructions on where to find this treasure. It was valued somewhere between a million and two million dollars. Well, as you can imagine, modern-day treasure hunt, people got really excited. Over 350,000 people went looking for this treasure. Some quit their jobs. Some bought a camper and moved and spent time searching. And for 10 years, that treasure went unfound. Back in 2020, uh, people had a little more time on their hands, I think. And so there was a guy by uh, the the name of Jeff Stauff, and he was a, a medical student from Michigan, uh, Jack Stauff, sorry, medical uh, student from Michigan. He was 32 years old and decided that he had deciphered the poem and was going to go searching. And for 25 days, he searched through Yellowstone National Park. And he was quoted uh, as saying this over those 25 days, that the treasure hunt was the most frustrating experience of my life. There were a few times when I exhausted, was covered in scratches and bites and sweat and pine pitch. And nearing the end of my day's water supply, I sat down on a downtrodden tree and just cried alone in the woods in sheer frustration. Jack actually found the treasure, and you can see pictures of it online. It was valued at $1.3 million, and it took a few months for him to actually admit where he found it, but it was in Yellowstone. But, you know, it's interesting you think about the things that you search after. I just I was st- stuck, struck by his comment that he was frustrated and crying because of what he was searching for, what he had treasured, he couldn't find it. You know, the wisest person who ever walked the face of this earth once said that if you want to know where your heart is, look at what you treasure. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. And this idea that what we we treasure tends to determine our actions and our efforts and our thoughts and our our energies and and our choices. And if, if anything was found to be true after that search for that treasure is that if you treasure something that you're having trouble finding, it'll lead you to a really stressed and frustrated place. And so I think it's a good question for us to ask is, do you know what you treasure? And how do you know? Some of you might go, yeah, I think I know. Like, I think if you ask a lot of us in an honest moment, we would say, well, I treasure my family, or I treasure my friends, or I treasure my relationships, or I treasure uh, my relationship with God. But I wonder if you peel back and you look at the way you spend your time and your energy and your actions, what would your heart truly reveal to you? If you were with us last week, we kicked off a new series called simply Faith. And we said that as people, we all have faith in something. It's either, it might be faith in God, it might be faith in nature, it might be faith in uh, politicians or political systems or your own efforts, but we all have faith in something. And what we have landed on is the fact that what faith means is trust. Somebody say trust. What you trust is what you have faith in. And so as you kind of think about that, what are we trusting in most? I saw a picture uh, this week of uh, somebody cleaning a skyscraper. You ever wonder how much these guys make, right? It's got, they get hazard pay, like double, triple pay, right? So imagine you're hanging from the side of a skyscraper in New York City, cleaning a window. You gotta have a lot of faith, right? You gotta have a lot of trust. What's your trust then? The cables, the company, that thing you're standing on, 
If you're Tom Cruise hanging from the side of a building in Dubai, it's those little gloves. You know what I'm talking about? But the reality is this guy, he's done it so many times that he's got faith that it's going to work. It's, it's subliminal at this point. And I think a lot of us, it's the same way. A lot of us, we move in and out through life, in and out through our day-to-day, and we have faith and trust in certain things. And it's become subliminal. We aren't thinking, every time I get in my vehicle, is this vehicle going to start, right? Every time you sit in those chairs, is this chair going to hold me up? We have this subliminal trust in our experiences and in our actions. And so I, I want us today to just to peel back the onion and ask, if we look at our lives, what, is our, what do our lives reveal about what we trust most? In Mark chapter 10, we see that Jesus is approached by a man who asks him a really big question, a a huge question. And I think if we look at the question and we see Jesus' response, it teaches us a lot about how Jesus sees faith. And I think it can reveal a lot to us about how we should see faith too. If you have your Bibles, grab those. If you have your phone, open up the YouVersion app or whatever app you use and flip to Mark chapter 10. 10, and we're going to be in a story that many people know as the rich young ruler. And so in Matthew, in, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus has been on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way towards the um, kind of the, the last leg of his ministry before he goes and starts flipping tables in the temple and all those things. And he, he is walking and he and his disciples, and there's no doubt a big crowd with them. And we see that a man uh, comes up to Jesus. Notice, notice this in uh, Mark chapter 10. Starting in verse 17, it says this, and, and as he, Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt down before him. Now, he didn't just like happen to mosey on over. He, he ran up and knelt down. So notice, there's an eagerness to them, to this guy. The question he wants to ask is really important. It's something that's weighing on his heart, something that's weighing on his mind. He needs to find out the answer. So he runs up and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. If you follow Jesus' ministry at all, if you've read the the biographies about Jesus, he talks about the kingdom of heaven a lot. And so this is the idea, like the kingdom of heaven, eternal life, this picture of like, there's got to be more, right? There's got to be something more. So this man runs up, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit, inherit eternal life? Now, we don't know much about this guy. Matthew tells us that he was young. Luke tells us that he was a ruler. Mark tells us later that he's rich. And so we call him the rich young ruler. Never actually says that, but that's where that comes from. So, but, but we know he's, he's got to have some kind of a position. In those days, to be wealthy, you come from a wealthy family, or you're a landowner. Maybe his, his dad was a priest. I mean, there's something going on here where the man has wealth. He has possessions. But, but while, we, while we don't know who he was, what we do see his response in Jesus, or his question in Jesus' response and it's really interesting. I want you to just notice this. Look at verse 18. He, say, he calls Jesus a good teacher. Notice what Jesus says to him. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, this is interesting because a lot of scholars like Bart Ehrman and, and atheists who want to try to shake people's faith will say, well, Jesus didn't think he was God. We made it up later because Jesus says right here that he's not good. Come on. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is instead of he's checking the man's heart. See, Jesus knows that this man sees Jesus as a miracle worker. He sees him as a great teacher. He doesn't see him as God yet. And we're going to see that in the exchange. So he goes, why do you call me good? Checking the man to see, well, who do you say that I am, right? That's what's going on here. Jesus didn't forget who he was. Jesus was saying, only God is good alone. Do you recognize who I am yet? Does that make sense, class? That makes sense? So we, we see that Jesus kind of checks him right there, and he says, well, why do you call me good? And then so the man, back to the question. He's asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I want you to notice this, that, that question inherit, it's this idea of earning something, right? Like, what must I do to earn eternal life? What must I do to earn this kingdom of heaven that you've been preaching about? Maybe he was in the crowd one day and he heard Jesus talk about this. What what do I need to do to to earn this, Jesus? What must I do? You know, I I think what what this man is going through is something that each of us experience, and it's this idea that deeply ingrained inside of us is this desire to earn or to put in effort. Like, we, we learn it from a really young age, right? Even in elementary school, it's about earning good grades. It's about getting a good job and earning a good paycheck, 
right? It's about earning someone's trust or earning someone's hand or earning someone's blessing. I mean, even in in, in the work culture, right? It's about earning a raise or getting promotion or or earning enough to one day retire. And And it feels like what culture and society and the world is telling us is that we need to continually work hard on our part to make sure that we get to where we wanna go. It's the old saying, right? If you want it done right, you gotta do it yourself. And so we, we see that in this rich young ruler. It's all kind of about what can I do? He's talking to Jesus, but yet he's saying, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And I want you to notice how Jesus responds here. This is, this is not by accident. This is really, really important. Notice what he says in verse 19. He says, well, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and your father. And so Jesus goes straight to the Ten Commandments. What's interesting, though, is don't, don't miss where he starts here. He, go, he goes straight to the ten, ten Commandments, but he starts at number five. How many are there? I just told you, right? There's ten. But he doesn't start at number one. He, he goes to number five. Now, there's no doubt this guy would have known the Ten Commandments. I mean, if you were growing up, a, a Jewish boy or a Jewish girl in Jewish culture, the Ten Commandments get pounded in your brain growing up. And so he knew the Ten Commandments. So Jesus starts at number five for a reason. You don't have to flip there, but if you go back to the book of Exodus and you actually look at the Ten Commandments, what what you'll notice is that these these Ten Commandments aren't just this list of rules. So a lot of times I think we we look at God's word and we're like, man, it's just a list of rules. It's just a list of shall and shall nots, do's and do nots. It's just this list of rules. But really, the Ten Commandments are these commands that God gives us because it's what's good for us. And the Ten of them are how we relate to God. Imagine them as like guardrails, guideposts, right? Rumble strips. It's like, this is how we relate to God, the first four, right? Don't have any other gods before me. Don't take my name in vain. Don't, you know, work all week long, honor me by taking a day off to worship and to rest. You know, we, we, we see this in the Ten Commandments. And then he goes, you know, we see God tell Moses to tell the children of Israel. Like, then it's like, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't covet, don't do all these things. It starts off with our relationship with God first, and then it comes with our relationship with one another. Jesus doesn't start with the first four. Why? Because he can tell this guy is all about what he can do and what he can earn. It's not at all about his relationship with his heavenly father. And you can tell by how he responds. Notice this, verse 20. And the, the teacher, remember he called him good teacher at first? Now he just calls him teacher. And, and the, the rich young ruler says, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Now, what's interesting is, anybody ever heard of a bar mitzvah? So a, what a bar mitzvah is, when a Jewish boy turns 13, they have a big party for him. I was in Israel last January and we got to see this. They have these dudes with trumpets and saxophones and they're carrying like these little teepee things and everybody's yelling, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. But at, at age 13, it, bar mitzvah means son of the law. So when you turn 13, if you're a kid in here and you're older than 13, be glad you live in the U.S. Because at, I guess you could be Jewish and live in America still. But at age 13, you're required to keep the law. And so this man, this, this rich young ruler is like, hey, ever since age 13, I've been required to keep the law. I've done all these things. I'm doing everything the law is requiring me to do. So Jesus, have I inherited eternal life? Jesus, has I made it? But notice here, the, the whole point of the law wasn't to help you figure out how to earn heaven. It was to show you that you couldn't earn heaven and that you needed God in your life. You needed God to help you do it. This man had missed it. And so Jesus is saying, look, do you see what you're missing? Do you see that you're trying to do all these things on your own? And I think what Jesus is telling us here is that trusting in your own effort reveals your heart. You want to know what you, what you trust? You want to know what you treasure? If you're trusting in yourself, it tells, it tells you. It's like the check engine light, right? When you, when you look on your dashboard and you see the check engine light, like, can you drive it? You can. Is it going to break down? At some point. And so it's the same thing. If if you are noticing that you are living your life trusting in yourself, then it's going to reveal to you that you're treasuring what you can accomplish on your own. And you're pulling God out of the equation. (laughs) And I think that this is something that all too often happens 
to us because, because of culture, because of society, because of, you know, we, we, in fact, we live in a sinful world where just sin and brokenness are around us. We tend to believe that it's all on me. And then when good things happen or God blesses us, we tend to think that that was because of my own strength or my own skill or my own good looks or whatever. Some of you might know the name Samson. If you guys uh, grew up in Sunday school or uh, remember the old flannel graph boards, you might remember Samson, right? The rock played Samson not too long ago. Samson was a big, strong dude in the book of Judges, chapter 16. And if you know the story about Samson, when Samson was born, God told Samson's mom and dad, he tells Samson not to do these things, but to honor me with his life. And one of the things was don't cut your hair, right? Now, some of us can't help it, right? But for Samson, he had really good hair. We're, we're assuming it was really good hair. I'm sure it was. So it's like Brad Pitt, right? Like river runs through it hair, you know, one of those kind of hairs. And so Samson, like God uses him to defeat the Philistines, but Samson's not really a good dude, but yet he honored God in this and God used him to, um, to, to really rescue Israel from bad situations. Well, Samson got arrogant. He started dating this, na- this lady named Delilah and Delilah was getting fed information on the back end from the Philistines about how to capture Samson. And so Samson, over time, gets worn down, and because of his arrogance and his pride, he tells her what it is. He says, well, if you cut my hair, I lose my strength. And I I can't imagine he would have said that if he truly would have believed that was true. At that point, I I think he really thought it's him that has the strength. So guess what happens? She cuts his hair. He ends up getting arrested by the Philistines. They gouge his eyes out. It's a horrible situation. He's blinded from this situation. God does use him later when his hair grows back out. But in that moment, pride and arrogance struck. And I wonder, when we think about our lives, is it pride and arrogance that can sometimes strike us too, to lead us trusting in ourselves and to thinking that it's all on me to accomplish what God really is calling me to do? C.S. Lewis talks about this, and he says this. This is so good. He says that, that pride is a spiritual cancer that eats up the possibility of love, contentment, and get this, common sense. And I think we can all look back at our lives and go, yeah, that wasn't very smart of me. Why did I do that? Pride. Arrogance. And so what happens, we are destined to fall when pride blinds us. And so if you are in a place right now where you're looking back in your life and you're going, man, this last year has been really hard. You might look and go, man, I, I think maybe I had a situation of pride and arrogance. And what happens is when we get to the end of our road and we fail, it either wrecks us, it leads us to pursue something else to make us feel better, so drinking, drugs, gambling, whatever, right? can be anything, fill in the blank. Or it leads us to kick into gear to the point where we burn ourselves out, wear ourselves out, and just eventually give up. All of that can come from something that seems simple in thinking that I have the power to do what I need to do on my own. And so what Jesus wants to do is he wants to help this rich young ruler, this guy who's got his life ahead of him and so much potential, He wants to help him see that he's missing it, that he's going to end up wrecking himself at some point. And so Jesus looks at him and does something amazing. I love this. Look at verse 21, if you have your Bibles out still. He says this. He he looks at him. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. I just love that. Isn't that good? Like, can you imagine the eyes of Jesus, like, you know, we see so many times throughout the Gospels that Jesus looks at these Pharisees and these scribes and these religious elitists, and he looks at them with almost condemnation. He's like, how dare you put a weight on these people back, people's back? How dare you act like this? How dare you be selfish? How dare you? But yet Jesus doesn't do that at all with this man. He looks at him, and he loves him. He sees him. He sees his heart. He knows he wants something better for this guy. And he says that you still lack one thing. You know, I think sometimes we, we, we look at this and we read the words of Jesus and we, we get to those shall and shall nots. We read those do and do nots and we think that what God wants us to do is just not enjoy our life. I mean, anybody ever had that thought? Like, be honest. You're like, man, God, these do's and do nots, these are so restricting. It's almost like God is this like fun killing monger who sits in heaven and laughs at us, Right? He wants us just to sit in like a cold room with an old translation of a Bible and crossword puzzles, right? And not doing anything fun. And we're like, what, what, what is, you know, like what's the whole point, God, of, of living this life that we're supposed to enjoy if, 
you're going to take the fun out of everything. But I think what the do's and do nots, the shall and shall nots are really trying to say is that Jesus is trying to help redeem the joy and contentment and enjoyment in life because it's those things that we think are going to lead us there that actually steal it from us. You know, God has a plan for us. And the plan is beautiful. And he calls it good. And then we insert all of our own junk in the way, thinking that that's better than God's plan. And what does it do for us? It steals our joy. It steals our contentment. It steals our hearts. And we end up thinking again that I have to do something to get there. When Jesus is saying, no, it's freely right here for you every single moment. You don't have to do anything to earn this. I came and lived my life for you and gave my life for you and rose from the grave so you can have this. All you have to do is accept it. You don't have to do anything to earn it. But sometimes things get in the way. And for this man, there was something that was in the way and Jesus knew it. And so he says this in verse 21, look back. He says this. Jesus looked at him, he loved him, and he said, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, what was it that's still in this man's heart? In this man's case, it was his possessions. It was his wealth. You know, there's something about money. Whether you have money or you don't have money, it doesn't matter. It's not money. It's It's the... Love of money. It's thinking that money is what fills in the blank. So people have money, people don't have money. We all fall in the same boat when we think that it's money that's going to fill our tank. And there's something about money, something about this love for, for money that has a way of lying to us. It says that money will change how you feel about yourself. Or it says that money will give you a sense of purpose or money that will, have, will make you happy. But if any of you have ever had some money in your pocket and you really wanted to spend it, you know But that's not the case. Anybody ever been out for ice cream at like four in the afternoon? What happens at eight in the afternoon, right? You're like ready to eat a whole cake, right? You're like, I'm gonna go out for ice cream. Let's go get some ice cream and we'll take it easy tonight. And next thing you know, you're like in the dark with one of those spotlight on your head, like combing through your kid's Halloween candy before bed, like 20 pieces of Twix in, right? And you're like, man, I shouldn't have had that ice cream. You know, like it was something kind of simple, but it's the idea that our appetite, and sugar, by the way, is the devil, right? And so, you know, a form of the devil, right? Not the devil, just one of his tools, right? And so the, like, the reality, and we still love Dairy Queen, though. We love Dairy Queen. <laughs> go, go see Michelle and Jimmy, please. But sugar has a way of making your appetite grow, and guess what else has that same thing? the love of money. I remember when I graduated from Mizzou, I got my first job after college and I was like, I made it. I'm making like, you know, I was making like $8 an hour in college. I'm making like $11 an hour, you know? And it was great. And I remember I went out and bought some new clothes. I bought a cool truck. By cool truck, I mean like a $3,000 truck, right? But it was still cool. And then I ended up going on a vacation. I do all these things. And next thing I know, my credit card is like maxed out. And then I get another credit card. Guess what I did with that one? You know, and it just like, it just, this appetite grows and grows. And that's what sin does. That's what sugar does. That's also what the love of money can do. And and so I think this is what we have to keep an eye on if we're we're not careful. And this is what's going on with the rich young ruler right here. Jesus is saying to him, he's saying, look, you, you, you love money and your possessions way more than you love God right now. And you have to do something about that. And so notice verse 21 again, he says, look, for you, you need to sell your possessions. You need to stack some treasure in heaven, and then you need to come and you need to follow me. I.e., you need to stop putting something else first. You need to put me first. Like the only way for you to inherit eternal life, for you to experience the kingdom of God, for you to experience the goodness and joy of life, God's blueprint for your soul is to follow me. It's not to earn it on your own. You know, there's, there's always been this debate around what Jesus means here. Some, some have taken this to mean that Jesus thinks wealth is bad, that Jesus thinks money is bad. And some have said, okay, and pe- people have actually taken vows of poverty to do this. 
But, but Jesus is not saying, I don't believe he's saying that you need to go live in a van down by the river, right? I think Jesus is saying here that you just need to check what it is in your heart. For this case, for this guy, it's money. So Jesus is saying specifically, whatever it is that you're trusting in is going to get out of the way, in the way, it's going to steal your heart. And in this case, and unfortunately for many of us, it is wealth. And so Jesus is saying this, that trusting in wealth places a stranglehold on your heart. Like if you want to live with a true heart, you want to live with a pure heart, you want to be able to do the things God calls you to do. When we trust in our wealth, whether we have any or not, but when we trust in it, when we think it's going to take us there, it's going to put a stranglehold on our heart and we're going to have trouble experiencing all the other things that God wants us to do. It's really interesting. If you, if you took all the verses in the Bible and you put them by category, Jesus talks about money more than he does about faith, more than he does about prayer, more than he does about heaven. Why do you think that is? Why was Jesus talk about money? And, and by the way, What's the one thing we don't want to talk about at church, right? Money. We don't talk about it very much. Today, we're going to talk about it a lot. But we often don't talk about it a lot because it's an uncomfortable topic. But Jesus talks about it a whole lot. Why? I think it's this. Because Jesus knows that money is a hard issue. And it's one of the, not the only reasons, but one of the most likely reasons that someone chooses not to follow him. I think that's why Jesus talks about it a lot because he knows what wealth can do. He, he, he gets it. Pew Research did a study a few years ago, and they were looking at places in the world where people say at a higher percentage that they think that religion and their relationship with God is most important to them. Here's a graph. You're not going to be able to see it because it's too small, if, unless you have really good eyesight or glasses on. But here's what you're going to notice, that they found that people who live in the poorest countries are the people who considered religion to be something that is very, very important to them. So in this case, you'll see like the Middle East, you'll see Africa, you'll see Central America, you'll see, um, you know, some, some places in South America. But notice as you work your way down the curve, when you get to the bottom of the curve, these are the nations that say it's least important in their life when they talk about religion or faith or God. It's the wealthiest countries in the world. Now, the United States is kind of an outlier. We're kind of in the middle, although we're one, we are, the, you know, the wealthiest nation. Uh, but Canada, Australia, Germany, Britain, Japan, France, these countries that have wealth, they say that religion is not important to them. Their relationship with God is not important to them. Now, why do you think this is? Some have said, well, it's because people in poor countries don't have anything, so they fall for this belief that God's just going to fix stuff for them. Is that really it? Or could it be that when you live in a country of affluence, and if we live in America, we don't think we have much. We do compared to the countries at the top. When you live in a place of affluence, you don't need to trust in anything else because you have what you need already. Like something happens, you can fix your car. Just pull out your debit card. When you live in Pakistan, or you, leave, you live in the Philippines, or you live in Kenya, you can't do that. And so for those people, they have not had the distraction of wealth in their life. They just haven't had it. But yet they see that religion, faith, and the relationship with God is super important in their life. So there is a correlation here. You can connect the dots on your own, but there is something to be said about the fact that a love of wealth, trusting in wealth, whether you have it or not, can put a stranglehold on your heart. And so Jesus is challenging this man, but also his disciples. And he's, he's challenging them to see that God's plan is to release the grip that money has on your heart and instead trust and follow him. And the same could be true for whatever it is. If it's a relationship, if it's a career, whatever has your heart, Jesus wants you to release the grip of that so that you can follow him. And so notice what happens. So Jesus has this conversation with this man. Remember, this man ran to him, right? Remember that? He ran to Jesus, super excited. Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? They have this exchange. Jesus says this to him. And notice in verse 22 what happens. It says, disheartened by the saying, he went away, what? Sorrowful. For he had great possessions. Like he went away shocked. There's no conversation. There's no debate. He wasn't like, hold on, Jesus, do I have to give it all away? Or like, just a little bit? 
He wasn't like, hold on, Jesus, it's not really that, it's my house or it's my new Tesla or whatever, right? He just goes away, sorrowful. Here's a question, write this down. If you want to know what has your heart, ask what makes you sad or what makes you mad. Something will reveal where your treasure is. So I want you to step back and see this conversation real quick. Okay, so Jesus has a conversation with this guy. This guy's really excited to find out what he needs to do to go to heaven what he needs to do to experience this kingdom of God stuff, which isn't just heaven. It starts the moment you say yes to Jesus, that you can live the rest of your life experiencing the goodness and the glory and the blessings of following Jesus. He wants to know how to get that. He says, what do I need to do? Jesus says, what you need to do is you need to get your heart right with me and follow me. And the man doesn't even debate. He just walks away sad. Now you might read this and go, hold on, it's crazy. Here's Jesus standing in front of you, like the one who came to rescue your soul, and you walk away from him? But at that moment, notice, he chose his possessions and walked away from Jesus. He, he, he understood. This man wasn't confused. He didn't need to go home and think about it. He understood. He, he, money had his heart, and he, was, he just accepted it. And he walked away. He realized that he was trusting in his wealth rather than having any relationship with God. And so then Jesus turns and he looks at his disciples, and this is interesting. This is, notice this exchange. Jesus kind of gives a, a metaphor here, which he was so good at. He says this. He looks at his disciples, verse 23, and he says, How difficult will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter through the kingdom of God. And it says that the disciples were exceedingly astonished. Why were they, I mean, like, have you been exceedingly astonished recently? You know? Like last Sunday at about 3.45, I was kind of exceedingly astonished. <laughs> I, I earn it. I, I deserve it after all that's been said. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's cool. <laughs> but think about this. In, in the Old Testament, one of the things that, that I don't think God's people really understood yet until Jesus came was that people often looked at wealth as a, 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 the sign of a blessing from God. So you'd meet somebody and they were rich and you'd be like, oh, God's favor is on that person. It's just like a misunderstanding, I think, of, of God's people. And um, you often see this, this idea where God is trying to help people see that it's not about what you have, it's about who you have. And, and the, the reality is, I think the disciples probably thought that wealth was a sign of God's blessing. And so what you have here is the disciples are following Jesus, thinking that Jesus is going to be king and that someday they're going to be on his right and his left and they're going to have these positions in the cabinet of Israel. And because of that, they're going to be rich and they're going to have wealth and land and horses and Ferraris and all kinds of stuff. And so by Jesus saying this, they're like, whoa, hold on a second. They're shocked. They're exceedingly astonished. And so then they're trying to rationalize all this and they say, well, if God's blessing isn't on the rich, then who can be saved? You see the line of thought that's going on here? And so notice what Jesus says. Classic verse. Some of you, you know this. Verse 27, it says this. And Jesus looked at them. He says, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are, what church? Possible with God. And so, so what is Jesus saying here? What, what is Jesus getting at? He's saying this. He's saying that money, the love of money, Again, whether you have it or not, money can't buy you happiness or success or eternal life. Instead, the love of it wants to steal your freedom, so instead, don't let it. Instead, put your faith in me. You can't earn it. It's impossible. It doesn't matter what you have, how hard you try. You can't earn it. You can't earn eternal life. You can't earn God's favor. But you can be, receive it freely by following me. There's a great verse in John 10.10. 10. It's, it's the verse that our uh, church mission statement is based out of, and it's this. Jesus talks about how everything wants to come and steal and kill and destroy. That the thief, whether that's the devil, that's evil people, that's sugar or money, he, it wants to steal and kill. But Jesus says, I came so that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came because he is the only one that can help us to see that the fullness of life that we all know we were created to live can only be found in taking all this other junk that we think becomes it and putting it in its rightful place. They're gifts, they're blessings, but it's not God. And turning and following him. 
And so is Jesus saying that wealth is bad? No. Does God bless some people to be a blessing? Absolutely, 100%. But is Jesus warning us that we need to have a healthy relationship with money, he is. He's saying we just gotta be careful what we're trusting in because what you trust in can easily grip your heart. And a love for money has a way of stealing your heart like few other things can. And so I I haven't taught on this in years, and so I thought it might be important for us to lean into this. And Pat talked about this a little bit this morning. What is God? If God has a plan for our lives that says, how do we keep other things from stealing our hearts? Then what is his plan? You know, we'll we'll see things where God talks about sex. We'll see where God talks about marriage. We'll see where God talks about sin and immorality and different things. And the reason those do's and do nots and shall and shall nots are there is to keep you from letting your heart be stolen by something. Because your heart can be stolen by all kinds of things. You know, it's Martin Luther that says that our hearts are idle factories. Like, we can easily let our hearts be stolen by our favorite teams or by our our careers or by anything. And so one of the things that we see, he talks about this with with money. Now, I want you to take yourself back in the past. We see that the the people of Israel are, are slaves in Egypt. And God uses a man named Moses to, bring, Moses to bring them out. They cross the Red Sea. They take them to the promised land where they're getting ready to move in to this new home they're going to have. And God wants to teach them to be a people, to be a community. And so he talks to them about what do they do with all their stuff, right? These guys didn't have big bank accounts, but they had, they had farms. They had cattle, right? They had honeybees. Just imagine, they had all these different things. And so God, knowing how possessions can steal your heart, he teaches them something called giving of the first fruits, or that's where we get the word tithing from, as Pat mentioned earlier. Notice Leviticus 27.30. So um, if you want to read, go back and kind of read this whole account of what happened, go to the book of Exodus. If you're really excited, go to the book of Leviticus. It's fun, really light, easy read, easy read. And so Leviticus 27, 30, you, you see that, he, that God talks about all kinds of stuff to keep your heart from getting stolen by all these different things. And he gets to money or possessions mainly in this case, uh, which for us looks a little differently maybe than it did for them. But he says this, a tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain or fruit, is the Lord's and is holy. And what that means is, he, he's saying this, that, that if we don't give to God first, then what's gonna happen is, We're going to give God our leftovers. Go back to the book of Genesis. You see the first murder, Cain and Abel. You guys, if you're familiar with that story, what happened was God, um, Cain and Abel were both giving God an offering. Abel gave God the best animal that he had. Cain gave God his leftovers. God praised Abel, not Cain. Cain got mad, murdered his brother. Now, I'm not suggesting that if you give God your leftovers, you can become a murderer. But I am suggesting that there is something really critical about giving God your best first if you want God to have your heart. So one of the things you see here is that God is calling the nation of Israel and subsequently God's people to give God their best first. And so he says, give us a tenth. Give the church a tenth. Set it apart. Make it holy. Give it to God. God's going to do something good with it. But this is a way for you to simply release the grip that wealth can have on your heart by giving the first 10% to him. Does that make sense? So that's the idea, is that we're gonna, we're gonna give God the first 10% and we're gonna learn to live on the other 90%. And this was really important again because God knows what happens, but there's also a trust here. Somebody say trust. So when you give God the first and best, you're trusting God to help you live on the rest. And so I'm saying, God, same with the same idea with rest and Sabbath, right? Like, God, I'm gonna take a day off work. Like, imagine being a farmer saying, God, for one day I'm not gonna go out and I'm not gonna go out and, you know, farm, or one day I'm not gonna go out and be a rancher and I'm not gonna take care of my cattle. What are you doing? You're trusting in God that He's gonna take care of things for you. And so God is saying, when you give to Him first, you're keeping your heart from being stolen by these other things. And I think Jesus is wanting us to take away that generous living leads to freedom that if you want to free your heart from all this junk that wants to steal it, then we have to do something to make sure that we're running towards Jesus. And generous living is how we do that with wealth and with our finances. 
I want to kind of share a verse here before we wrap up. It's this, Proverbs 3. It says this, that honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, and then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. It's kind of a picture. I don't know how you guys have vats at home. Anybody have any vats or barns? But it's just the idea that as we're generous, as we give God first, God blesses us in return. We don't give to be blessed. It's just the reality of God's economy in this upside-down kingdom. We think that we get, we get what we want by spending. We actually get what we want by giving. I shared with you earlier about Forrest Fenn's treasure and that how Jack Strauff ended up finding the treasure. Over the 10 years that people were searching for the treasure, five people actually died looking for that treasure. Here's just a picture of the five. Some of them um, got stuck in the snow. Some fell off cliffs. But they gave their life to something that they were seeking after with their heart. And what did it end up doing? It didn't end up bringing them life. It didn't end up bringing them happiness or hope. It ended up bringing them death. And I'm afraid, whether it's money or not, if we let our heart be stolen by something other than giving it to God, it's going to try to kill us too. Here's a question I just want you to wrestle with. I want you to see that God doesn't want something from us you want something for us? That's the whole point of this. You'd experience joy and peace and, and happiness, things that you want. And he knows that you have to do something about it. And so the challenge that I think he's asking us here is, what would it look like for us to give God our best first? And we look around at this world and we see that inflation is crazy. It's horrible. But God doesn't tell us to trust in politicians. We look around and see that the housing market has gone nuts and that the cost of groceries is out of this, out of this world. But God doesn't tell us to trust in the economy. We look around and see that there are all kinds of things and there's always gonna be something that we're not ready to do yet or we're not ready to have yet or we're not ready to be content with yet. But God doesn't tell us to trust in ourselves. What God calls us to do is to trust in him, in him alone. So the question I think God is wrestling with all of us today is, what does it look like for us to give God our best first and to trust him with the rest?